Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We are at the top of the hour, and I want to welcome you uh, this morning or this afternoon to the Greater Houston Area ACRP Chapter webinar, um, partnering with Deep Six AI um, to talk about accelerating patient recruitment with artificial intelligence. Um, First, I want to start with a few housekeeping items. Um, everyone should be muted upon entry to the meeting, so please um, do not unmute yourself. This session will be recorded. During the presentation, after each speaker, we will have allocated time for Q&A sessions. Um, please submit your questions in the chat box as well. Um, one contact hour will be, will be available for this session. Um, the link will be placed in the actual chat box, which will explain how you can claim those hours. Um, you have until February 23rd to actually claim that one hour, 30 days after the actual event. So my name is Lashana Green. I'm the president of the Greater Chapter, Greater Houston After Chapter of ACRP. And I wanna welcome you today. Um, Lori, if you can bring up the slide for me, we'll go ahead and um, start some very brief bio introductions for our amazing speaking panel, speakers panel today. Um, again, the, today's webinar is Accelerating Patient Recruitment with Artificial Intelligence. Our moderator for the event is Dr. Tony Hallway. Um, Tony is the head of clinical programs at the 6 AI, an AI powered software company for clinical trials. She oversees the success of its life sciences and health, um, health system clients. Um, Robert Stillman is the Director of Clinical Research Informatics at the James Comprehensive Cancer Center at the Ohio State University, the Ohio State University, let me correct that. Um, he provides strategic leadership for clinical research informatics and advises senior leaders on information technology initiatives. Dr. Sunet Matal is the chair of the cardiovascular service line for Valley Health System. He is the director of the electrophysiology for the Valley Hospital, medical director of the Snyder Center for Comprehensive Atrial Fibrillation at the Valley Hospital and Director of Cardiac Research for Valley Health System. Without any further ado, I'll hand it over uh, to Dr. Tony. Hello, thank you all for joining us this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're located. Uh, my name is Tony and I will be kicking us off with a quick introduction on AI and clinical research. I'll then hand things over to our first speaker, Robert Stillman, who will present his experience deploying an enterprise-wide AI program, followed by a brief Q&A. Next up will be Dr. Matal, who will present on his experience achieving recruitment with a positive impact on diversity, followed by a second Q&A session. Uh, learning objectives for this webinar include how AI can be used to improve clinical trials, how two health systems have approached deployment of an AI solution for clinical research, and finally, how AI-based recruitment can also impact diversity. Next slide, please. All right, just some quick personal background. I started my career as a CRC at an academic medical center, took a brief tangent to get my PhD and did a stint in biotech, uh, but then gravitated back to clinical research, first directing a health system clinical trials office, and then leading a clinical affairs in the medical device industry. Now I get to leverage all of that experience and some of that trauma to address clinical research challenges. It's definitely not news to anyone on this call that recruitment is one of those challenges. There are a variety of statistics floating around, some of which are so old, I find they border on being folklore, but they include scary figures like that 80% of studies are delayed due to enrollment issues, 11% uh, of sites don't enroll at all, and only 5% of the U.S. population participates in clinical research. COVID certainly exacerbated these challenges, and in the most recent data, I found the average monthly rate of patient enrollment per site still dropped from about 0.7 in the first quarter of 2022 to 0.3 in the third quarter. So there hasn't been a huge rebound, at least as of 2022. 
Next slide, please. There is a lot of investment in recruitment. In fact, a huge chunk of clinical trial budgets go to recruitment, and it makes sense why. Trial delays just have a major impact, and not just on the sponsor's bottom line. From a public health perspective, delays in the approval of life-saving drugs means lives lost. Next slide, please. There are a number of reasons why clinical trial recruiting is such a challenge, and we all know them, right? Complex and restrictive inclusion and exclusion criteria, high participant burden, participant mistrust in clinical research, among others. But just finding potential participants is also a challenge. A 2023 study that surveyed investigative perceptions of research found that the most commonly used recruitment strategies, in-person recruitment and EMR review, are also considered the most inefficient and labor intensive. And this is an area where AI can help. Next slide. Potential use cases for AI and clinical research are actually quite broad. First and foremost, AI can be used to mine large volumes of clinical data to inform protocol development particularly inclusion exclusion criteria, design a study around data and populations that exist, conduct due diligence to ensure that a site has a suitable patient population prior to opening a study. This would result in time and cost savings for sites and sponsors alike. Obviously, accelerating patient identification can speed recruitment, mine clinical data for specific criteria to create a narrow list of patients for manual review. Finally, AI platforms can be leveraged to reduce site burden by facilitating the clinical evidence validation work that still has to be done by study staff. These are just the most tangible applications, but it isn't a huge jump to see the value of AI in more complex predictive modeling as well to potentially reduce screen failure rates. Next slide, please. The key to all of this is being able to access unstructured data. And that is why AI is such a game changer. So when we think about EMR data, there is structured data, such as diagnosis codes, medications, et cetera, and then unstructured data, which are things like provider notes, symptoms, lab, and imaging reports. While structured data is easier to query, the variability of unstructured data is a huge challenge. Unfortunately, that's where 80% of EMR data is found in the part of the iceberg below the surface. And it probably comes as no surprise then that much of what's needed for clinical trial eligibility is also in that unstructured data. AI is able to access that 80% in a much more efficient way and bring that evidence to researchers very rapidly. Next slide, please. Access to data, however, isn't enough. To be useful, you need access to the right data and AI can also provide this precision. So what do I mean by that? This is a very specific example highlighting some of the challenges of EMR data mining. If you look on the left-hand side, a protocol today may be looking for advanced triple negative breast cancer. On the right-hand side, as you start to look at different documentation styles and the way this phrase can be recorded within physician notes, you're gonna see nuances across different organizations and even different physicians. TNBC, triple negative BRCA, ER negative PR negative, HER2 new negative, and the list goes on. And that's a huge challenge. You just can't search for the words advanced triple negative breast cancer and expect to find everything. Precision matching is being able to translate the criteria you're searching for into all possible documentation variations so that all eligible participants are surfaced in any search. Next slide, please. Natural language processing and semantic annotations are kind of another level deeper, but also play a significant role in search accuracy. So going back to our breast cancer example, imagine searching an EMR for the words breast cancer. There is a big difference between someone diagnosed with breast cancer and someone with a family history of breast cancer. When extracting information, context is essential to understanding what's meant and this is another area that AI can play a big role. All right, with that background, I will hand the stage to Rob Stillman. As a reminder, please add any questions to the chat. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Tony. Uh, you really introduced why we, why we went down this path. Uh, <laughs> 
So again, my name is Rob Stillman. Uh, I am a oncology nurse uh, by background, and I live in the space between IT uh, research professionals and uh, my clinical colleagues, uh, and help really uh, bridge the gap between all three of those and help sort of service the, the hub of, of, of the wheel, so to speak. Uh, I come from, I mentioned, the Ohio State University James Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, in terms of space, we're the third largest um, cancer program in the country. Um, you can see our beautiful uh, hospital there. Uh, we have research and education spaces on every inpatient floor, uh, 200 plus oncologists, each of them who specializes in just a single type of, of cancer. So we're, we're actually one of those subspecialty type of hospitals. Um, and we have, uh, at any given time, hundreds of active or pending cancer uh, clinical trials, upwards of about 400 right now, um, many of which are initiated by uh, the, the providers, the clinicians um, that are caring for our patients um, every day. And we also have a dedicated early, uh, uh, early phase clinical trials unit. Our clinical trials office has about 150 uh, of your colleagues uh, that are helping to manage all of these um, and help to provide centralized management by bringing that, the necessary expertise into uh, specialized areas of clinical investigation. Uh, it includes uh, our protocol development, our regulatory administration and management, our trial activation and coordination, data management, protocol tracking and monitoring. Um, and while I don't fall directly under our clinical trial office, uh, our informatics component as well. Next slide, please. So I was tasked uh, in the before times, uh, Tony mentioned uh, COVID and a lot of the problems that she mentioned were really issues even, even prior to COVID. So we are uh, an NCI designated cancer center. Uh, we do very well with clinical trials enrollment, depending on the data that you ask. Uh, we're about 30% of our patients that come through the cancer program are on trials. Uh, however, that's very labor intensive. Um, and um, uh, as part of our NCI grant, we were asked, you're always asked to, to to do better. So moving the needle with our current systems was just not going to be feasible. So we started looking at uh, AI solutions. Uh, I won't go through the, uh, the long laborious process. And for those of you who work at academic medical centers know the challenge of being able to uh, select and go through the process of, of, of getting a vendor on board. But ultimately, uh, we landed with Deep Six. Uh, they met uh, a, a number of selection criteria that we had. Um, one being, and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that Dr. Mittal is on, is we didn't want this to be just a, a cancer um, tool or, or one for, for, for clinical trials related to cancer only. We, we wanted this to be disease agnostic. Um, so that was part of our selection. The other piece is that we wanted to own our data. Um, many companies will kind of come to us and say, we'll give you this great uh, uh, tool for free, uh, but we're going to sell your data uh, to, to, to Big Pharma or to, to other companies that, that may want to capitalize on that. Uh, and as, a, as an academic medical center, we weren't comfortable with that. Um, and then obviously then the relationship is something that's very important and I'll speak a little bit to that uh, later. So it was actually about uh, 2021 is really when we uh, were finally able to get, uh, at the end of 2021, be able to get our, our contract signed. And it took about a year uh, to get everything up and going. Um, and that is with risk assessments and um, uh, a data ingestion and understanding process. Uh, but we went live actually a year ago. Uh, this month, really, we, we had a kind of a soft launch in December of uh, 2022, but really live uh, in January of 2023. Uh, and we're almost done rolling uh, out to all of our disease teams. So we have uh, 16 disease teams within our cancer program. Uh, and we started a year ago with our head and neck and sarcoma teams. Um, you can see the progression uh, as we are working through 
uh, through each of those disease teams, uh, learning a great deal as we progress through uh, each new team that comes um, aboard. Uh, this week, actually, uh, the Deep Six team will be training our thoracic oncology team, um, and we're getting close to having it rolled out uh, completely over the course of the year. Um, our goals for uh, the implementation of an AI program, uh, I think Tony hit on the, the vast majority of why we looked at, why, at, at, a, at a program to even start, but the short term is to decrease um, time spent screening. Um, we did not want to hire uh, people just for the purpose of screening, um, so we wanted to reduce the time of the people that we already had and we wanted to minimize the need for additional resources for that screening. Uh, long term, uh, I think it's obvious uh, that even though we do uh, very, very well, we want to continue to increase our enrollment, uh, particularly of our uh, women, minority, and underserved populations. Uh, we want to improve the quality of our screening. We want to improve the ability to test feasibility. Uh, enhance matching using uh, additional genomics data. Uh, again, as Tony mentioned, our, our trials are becoming much, much more specific specific in using uh, specific genomic markers. Um, and then finally, uh, we're looking at uh, additional data sources that we might be able to use um, to uh, enhance our use of the Deep6 AI. Uh, we currently have a feed uh, from our uh, Epic PMR, and we also have a feed from four of our genomics vendors that go directly to G uh, Deep6, and that's what we are using to query for patients. Next slide, please. So um, our CTO manages the AI program, so it is uh, primarily a tool right now anyway for um, for our clinical research coordinators and our research staff. Uh, the idea is that we will eventually roll this out to our investigators. Uh, but right now, it's a, it is a tool to help with pre-screening, um, screening, validation, and recruitment of patients. Um, and each of those teams that I just talked about are involved in that. Um, and you can see the, the 16 teams there. So we'll be live with all but uh, four of those uh, in the next uh, in the next year. Uh, well, in the next week, we'll be live with uh, all except uh, our GI team, CLL, BMT, and cellular therapy. Um, but we have the vast bulk of our uh, research staff now using um, our, our AI solution. Uh, our disease teams uh, primarily are using AI to match patients based on upcoming appointments. And so the way that they're using this is uh, through our trial recommenders. So uh, most of our CRCs are embedded in clinics. And so they are downloading uh, patient medical record numbers uh, into Deep6 and looking for trials that may be available. Uh, conversely, they could also generate a list of patients based on uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria as well. But the, the real the real magic happens in matching patients uh, to trials uh, that are sitting right in front of them. Uh, and that is actually the component that we are hoping to be able to put in front of our physician colleagues um, very shortly as well. Next slide, please. So why do we use AI for recruitment? Um, there's considerable challenges uh, with using uh, just the electronic medical record. Um, and a lot of that is time is consumed screening patients based on appointment schedule. So it's really, uh, you know, it's like hitting the lottery if you have someone who actually meets the criteria. And it takes a lot of time and effort to read through um, an individual patient record, especially if they've had care for a considerable amount of time or they have very complex disease. Uh, for those of you who are in and out of the medical record, 
uh, while it's improved considerably over uh, the past decade or so that they've been in place, uh, things live in a lot of different places. Um, we are an Epic uh, uh, customer, uh, and Epic does have tools that allows us to search on uh, patients, but it's only using structured EMR data. So it is missing out on things that may be located in patient notes uh, or in other places in the record. Um, I don't know how other organizations work, but our, uh, our policies also very much limit uh, how Epic Slice or Dicer can be used for research. So we might be able to use it for feasibility by being able to get a list of patients uh, that may be available uh, available um, or eligible for trials uh, is not something that our, our clinical trials office staff are allowed to do. The other functionality that I just mentioned is that we don't have a way to be able to quickly determine what trials a patient may be eligible for based on the data that uh, and the applications that are available within Epic. Uh, and I think many of you are very uh, familiar um, with the complexity of inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, that are within uh, our protocols. Um, and those criteria are not uh, coded or uh, even presented in a way that is structured uh, to make it easy to find within the medical record. So these are uh, a lot of the challenges. Um, advantages of being able to incorporate something like Deep Six is that it allows for considerably faster screening um, with, the, with the power of the AI to mine the entirety of the electronic medical record. So as I mentioned, uh, Deep Six gets a uh, nightly ingestion of our clarity data. Uh, and so that is the entirety of our record. I think it's upwards when I looked actually this morning. Uh, about 2 million patients that it's looking at. So um, no matter how large your research office is, uh, the ability to screen 2 million patients in a matter of minutes is, is just not possible. Um, the AI and the natural language processing mine both structured and unstructured data uh, to match patients more precisely. Uh, for clinical staff, you know, particularly our physicians, we don't necessarily uh, document their care in a structured way. And I know this is a, kind of very controversial that we're trying to move towards more structured data, uh, documenting and structured data. But for many of us who've taken care of patients, uh, a narrative is where we're getting information and what tells the patient's story. Uh, so that ability to, to, to look into a note and pull that information out is, is really kind of the best of both worlds. Um, and the AI and the NLP can identify patients with very specific genetic markers uh, that are often found either buried within a clinician notes um, or buried uh, in disparate lab reports. Uh, one of the great things is uh, we have determined that it's easier to find our patients with particular genetic markers very quickly within uh, using our AI tools versus trying to find it buried. And for those of you who are Epic users, the, uh, the very fun media tab where you're trying to uh, look through and find uh, the, those reports and then you know, the markers um, within there. Next slide, please. Uh, so we've had a, a lot of lessons learned uh, over the course of the last year. Um, I think the first and foremost is that when we're writing and designing uh, protocols, our, the current way that we do business um, in writing protocols is that the inclusion and exclusion criteria needs to be easy for the AI to ingest. Um, and there's a lot of art and science and really clinical knowledge or very deep knowledge of protocols to be able to take that inclusion criteria and convert it into something that the AI can easily ingest. And so that is something that we have definitely learned that I will say I was very, a year ago was very naive uh, walking into. Um, and it's working with sponsors and with our investigators to 
you know, leverage the AI for protocol design and feasibility uh, that will hopefully limit some of the downstream issues that Tony talked about. So, for example, creating, uh, you know, time to trial is definitely an issue. Uh, the, the expense of uh, initiating trials in which you don't actually enroll any patients because they're too difficult to find. Um, one thing I spend a considerable amount of time doing is, is really setting realistic expectations. Uh, and it takes time for the AI to learn and to be trained. Um, and this is not the same sort of AI that we hear so much about in the media. It's not a, a Siri or a chat GPT or an open AI type of, uh, of system. This is really combing through uh, you know, masses of data, um, and it's not going to just give you an answer right away. And these queries are really iterative uh, in their design and their work. And if you think about uh, things like amendments and things like that, it's something that needs uh, care and feeding. Um, and it is not intended to, nor will it ever replace uh, the clinical knowledge that myself as a nurse would have, Dr. Mittal, Tony, or any of you as, as research. Uh, professionals would have. Um, and even though the patient may be a match, they might not be enrolled. Um, and that is not something that AI is going to pick up. There, there are reasons a patient may not be a good match. That may be their own uh, personal preferences. It may be where they are in their disease process. There are multiple reasons why. They just may not want to be on the trial. Um, AI has improved the efficiency of our screening process um, and reduced our time spent screening. Uh, I think this is particularly true of our breast team, for example, which is a very large team, uh, and they have really capitalized uh, on, on the use of the AI. Um, and finally, uh, AI not only finds patients for trials, but allows us uh, to find trials for patients. And that last bit, again, is really where we are um, most optimistic about this being incorporated into uh, our regular workflows and to be able to pull uh, you know, more clinicians beyond our research team uh, into helping to, to find trials for patients. Next slide. Right. So I think I'm in for questions now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. I'm sure there are many, many questions for Rob. Please add them to the chat if you haven't already. I'm going to just kick off with a quick moderator question to give people time to get their, their questions into the chat. Rob, how do you keep your teams and CRCs engaged using the AI software? So these are individuals who maybe weren't involved in the decision process, right? How do you engage them and keep them engaged? So um, the, the implementation of AI just won't work unless you have the experts on that study team actively engaged in helping uh, with writing those queries and validating the patients to make sure that those queries are working. So it's it's time and effort to make sure that they're getting in and they're using the system, that they're using the queries and they're making sure that they that the queries meet their need and that they're finding patients. Uh, once they see that the system indeed works and they're able to find patients that they otherwise would not have, um, then the engagement gets pretty easy. Um, but the, the, the crux of it is, is making sure that they're involved in uh, the, the query build in of itself and the iterations of that query build. Awesome. All right, questions from the audience. Who builds the studies or queries in Deep Six for you? <laughs> So right now, uh, we have Deep6 uh, helping us with those queries. And really, that's that was to help us get up off the ground. We're a very large site. Um, initially, I, I and my small team of about five people, um, uh, again, very naive, were like, well, I can build these queries. So, you know, I've got a lot of clinical knowledge. I've been a nurse for a long time. I've been involved in research. Uh, and one of our directors in our clinical trials office was like, you realize we have about 400 active trials 
uh, and this is nearly an impossible task. So we have partnered um, with Deep Six uh, in building those. Uh, uh, and so up to date, uh, our partnership with Deep Six, uh, we built about almost 300 uh, trials thus far. Um, it's not something that they do in a vacuum. Uh, so again, they work very Deep Six, uh, the builders who are clinical in nature or have research experience work with me, or they work with the disease teams to iterate on those queries and, and to build them. Uh, future state, that may change somewhat, but that's how we're managing for now. Okay, awesome. Um, did you say you're using Study Finder to help with your Deep Six efforts? And can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, or trial recommender. Yes, exactly. So um, uh, again, I, I, th this is really where our CRCs and, and going back to Tony's engagement question, um, this is what's keeping them engaged because they, instead of having to read through charts, they can take a clinic schedule and upload the MRNs into our trial recommender and quickly scan through uh, their patient list to see if uh, patients may be eligible for a trial and then you know, continue to go in and do further screening. So um, we are using that. Um, it is, has been very successful. We are on in the midst of a project right now to have that functionality available from within the medical record so that if you open a patient's chart, you would be able to click on uh, a deep six tab and those trials would be immediately visible to, uh, to, to the clinical end user. Okay, awesome. Um going to do one more question and then move on to Dr. Mattel's so we make sure we have time for his presentation. You mentioned improving efficiency of the screening process, reducing time spent on screening. Were you able to translate the metrics in the context of finance uh, resource analytics? So were you able to actually quantify less FTEs because of the tools that were implemented? So to be very frank, I think it's too soon to tell. Um, and we have developed uh, a tool that we are using to measure the time spent screening, whether we're using Deep Six or not. Um, and so I think if you ask me that question in a year, uh, we'll be able to, to, to you know, definitively answer that with data. Um, I think anecdotally, yes, it is It is most definitely reducing the time. I was on a call uh, just prior to this where we were looking for a particular population of patients that would have taken clarity, uh, you know, someone with clarity background and SQL experience to write a query and be able to deliver us something. It may take a week, it may take two weeks. I was able to do it. I don't have a strong IT background. I certainly can't write XML qu or, uh, queries or SQL queries uh, and was able to return a list of patients back within minutes. Um, and then quickly able to screen though, that evidence to determine if the patient was a good match or not. So anecdotally, I am 100% confident uh, that we have the ability to reduce that screen screening time. Um, I think over time and with this collection tool, we'll be able to get a better sense of, of that data and how much time. Okay, thank you so much, Rob. Um, I'm gonna end the questions there again, just to make sure we have time for Dr. Mattel's presentation. If there is time at the end of the second Q&A session, I'll circle back to some of these questions for Rob. If not, we are gonna be sharing the speaker's emails um, so that you can follow up with them directly if needed. Uh, so next, I would like to introduce Dr. Mattal from Valley Health. Again, please add any questions you have for Dr. Mattal to the chat. Um, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Mattal. We are so excited to hear from you. Tony, thanks very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Another reminder why you never want to follow a speaker from the Ohio State University. <laughs> Rob has already done such a wonderful job, so I have a, a real challenge ahead. Next slide. So most of you don't know anything about Valley, so I thought I'd level set the field and uh, just let you know about who we are. So the Valley Hospital 
is a fully accredited acute care non-for-profit hospital that's located in Bergen County. So essentially on the other side of the Hudson River from Manhattan, it uh, serves nearly half a million people in 32 adjacent uh, uh, cities in Bergen County. And our medical group uh, offers a wide array of services that ranges from pediatrics to primary care, and of course, from oncology to cardiology. Uh, and we're also pleased to have a very large home care uh, portion of the health system. Uh, we, it's one of New Jersey's largest home care agencies, and it serves more than 12,000 people in the Bergen and Passaic counties. And as you know, home is the new hospital, and to the extent that home is the new hospital and we're shifting sites of care, we feel that our home care uh, agency is really poised for great uh, things uh, uh, you know, uh, going into the future. Now, as it comes to the clinical trials and research, Tony mentioned to you previously that I'm responsible, you know, for the cardiac research program at, for the Valley Health System. And our program, of course, consists of coordinating clinical trials, screening, consenting, enrolling, communicating, regulatory guidance, and all the things that you would expect. Uh, but on a fundamental level, we do everything from uh, investigator-initiated studies to industry-sponsored device and drug trials. Uh, to NIH and federally uh, funded research. So the whole gambit is here. And we do our research across a very wide footprint that includes a research center, uh, the, the hospital system as well. Uh, we have a, a oncology outpatient, Luckel Pavilion, and a geographic footprint of practices that are located all uh, through uh, Northern and Western New Jersey, as well as an office in Midtown Manhattan. And we do uh, currently are doing research in, of, of course, oncology and cardiology, but some smaller uh, involvement in GI, ID, pulmonology, rheumatology, stroke, uh, as well, increasingly uh, in neurointerventional and other neuro neurological entities. So um, the picture you see here uh, is something we're very proud of, and that is the new Valley Hospital, which is going to open uh, on April 14th of this year. It's been a long time coming. Uh, it's really the first hospital that's been built from the ground up in decades in the state of New Jersey. Uh, it's an absolutely state-of-the-art facility, takes your breath the way, if anyone's here, we'd love to host you uh, and give you a, a tour uh, when the hospital opens in a, in a few days. Next slide. So it was already mentioned uh, that, you know, why AI is important. But if you take a look at it from my standpoint, you know, generally, if you're any site, it, the process starts like this. A, a An industry sponsor will come to you and say, listen, you know, we have this trial. We think you may be a good fit. And the first question is, you know, uh, how many patients do you think you have that are eligible for this trial? And how many can you commit to in a month, right? And so the investigator essentially makes up some number uh, because they, you know, believe in this trial, right? And so while, you know, that is the tried and true method, you know, it seemed to us that there's got to be a better way to be able to do that, to really separate out studies where you and the institution really are a good mix for this study versus those that you may not be. And, and so the first aspect of using uh, an AI-based uh, tool like this is to give you some help in trying to understand the feasibility of a trial at your site so you don't waste uh, uh, anybody's time or resources. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because, of course, resource time time and resource staff are very limited. Uh, so you want to use their time wisely. And it's also not a good mix if you go to industry partners and you are not uh, able to deliver on what you promise. You may not get the next trial where you may be a better mix uh, uh, for that study. So we're very cognizant uh, of that and want to do a better job with that. Now, let's say you are fortunate enough to be chosen as a trial site. You, of course, want to be able to identify patients that are eligible for these studies, uh, and you want to do it in a way uh, that's respectful of, uh, of research coordinator time, so they're not going chart by chart trying to do manual extraction of people. Um, and so what we try to do is build these sites, uh, build these studies within this AI platform identify patients, uh, you know, who may meet the initial AI match filter, and then use those charts uh, to go uh, and find the right patients. And Rob has already outlined some of the reasons why you still need a portion of manual review, and I'm happy to discuss that uh, in the QA as well. But it's a lot easier 
to find a patient out of 10 charts that have been, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, been found as opposed to going through a hundred or a thousand charts uh, to find those 10 patients that may be a potential eligible, uh, you know, uh, uh, fit for your study. Next slide. So I'm going to just uh, very briefly summarize the three use cases where we've used this. So the first uh, uh, is actually um, uh, uh, an issue uh, that has to do with diversity. And I'm going to uh, uh, discuss that in greater depth because it's so important and a passion of ours at, at Valley Hospital. So, so far... We built 56 unique trials. Uh, we built uh, three studies uh, 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 using AI to find eligible patients in the last year. And in one of the studies, I'm going to show you what the impact has been uh, on some of our DEI initiatives. Uh, secondly, we're using this increasingly to find patients uh, who are not being referred for other evidence-based strategies. So for example, uh, we have found uh, patients who are eligible uh, for mitral clipping. Um, and and and, uh, and and that's not to say that every one of these patients is uh, going to undergo mitral clipping, but at least it allows you to have an intelligent conversation with the patient and the referring providers. Uh, and we are uh, increasingly seeing this partnership between Deep Six and other organizations. And now there's a formal relationship, for example, between Deep Six and Graticule that can help identify patients, for example, who may be best served with having the Impella device. Uh, and then we're also looking at things like, you know, lots of patients undergo CT scans uh, of the of the chest or, 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 or heart. And we find that as an incidental finding, we're finding pulmonary nodules. And these pulmonary nodules require follow-up. And we're definitely scared that someone is going to be missed or fall through the cracks. And so AI allows us to identify those patients who may have these incidental findings that require follow-up and create an infrastructure that allows you to well manage these patients going forward. Next slide. So let me talk a little bit about, you know, this DI issue. So, you know, I'm I I know what the what the population of Bergen County looks like from a racial perspective. I in the ideal world, the patients that we're seeing at Valley Hospital would be identical to the patients that exist in Bergen County. And we don't see that same, um, you know, mix. So already we have our work cut out for us because, uh, you know, we are not able to recruit uh, to the hospital the patients that are reflective of the overall population of Bergen County. And then once you have the patients who come to the hospital, you would hope that you would have a nice mix of, uh, 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 of patients that are being enrolled in trials. Um, and you think that you have no bias, but AI really is an eye opener to tell you like how the bias uh, uh, would uh, uh, you know exist. And so here's one study we were doing of a drug called Versiguat for chronic heart failure uh, patients with reduced EF. And in the first year, you know, we a weren't able to enroll uh, many patients. We thought, well, you know, by you know, hey, we have lots of patients. We'd get two to three patients a month. We got six patients in a year. And then once we identified six patients, five of them fell out because of very complicated inclusion exclusion criteria. We tried some social media campaigns that uh, did nothing. Uh, and so we were very, very disappointed. Uh, and then we turned this over to Deep Six AI. And within two months, we found 126 patients that were potentially eligible for the study. Uh, importantly, um, we uh, found an increasing number of African-American patients who were eligible by the study. And these were then, uh, two thirds of these could be validated by clinicians after evidence review, uh, which was great because we hadn't achieved any of this when we were looking ourselves. Uh, and then just as Rob said, uh, our research team feels uh, that it's probably saves them up to an hour per patient screen so that, you know, time could be better invested uh, in, you know, other activities that are required of them. So we're very happy with this initial, you know, experience. Next slide. Now, listen, 
uh, let's be fair. You know, t technology doesn't come uh, free. Uh, there's no free lunch. And, you know, we have started off with one model, which is, you know, to pay, uh, you know, for this software thing. But we're also looking at, you know, uh, you know how we can evolve into other, you know, models. You know, should we, just like we get from a sponsor, you know, uh, fees to cover our IRB startup and closing fees, you know, is there an avenue here uh, to help them subsidize some of these platforms? platform fees uh, with the notion that it's going to help speed up enrollment uh, into these trials. You know, I think that's going to be very important. Now, we're also looking at other forms of partnerships, you know, to identify, uh, you know, these eligible patients that have been matched uh, into the system. Uh, and then, of course, from a from a site and feasibility issue, you know, we believe that uh, uh, this same thing uh, can be applied to non-sponsor trials, for example, like the uh, QA process that I mentioned to, you, you know, with oncology studies. So across the entire partnership platform, there are different business models that I think we have to explore before settling on, you know, which is the right one for any given uh, study uh, and any given institution. Next slide. So, what do I believe are the advantages of 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 an AI solution? Well, you know, I do think that uh, it it really helps you identify patients very quickly, especially those uh, that are uh, have complex I and E criteria uh, where you may need struck unstructured data, you know, to find patients. I believe that it saves time, and we've shown that because the staff is screening from a narrower, more precisely matched uh, uh, patient list, and it gives you greater visibility into those patients uh, that you are enrolling and helps you address you know, studies that may not be enrolling, studies that you may not be thinking about DI issues, et cetera, et cetera. But we also have recognized uh, that you know, things are different. You know, so Rob mentioned that he's on Epic. We may be one of the only hospitals left in the country that don't have Epic. You know, we are using Athena Health. So, you know, there are different intricacies that come from different vendors. There's also problems in the way things are done. So like uh, many of you, if any of you are in cardiology, for example, I'll give you an example of a heart failure study, a heart failure studies, you know, where it's difficult. So for example, Heart failure studies will say, does the patient have heart failure? Well, yeah, that you can get, you know, from your EMR. Does the patient have systolic heart failure? Yeah, you can get that from your EMR. But now let's say you're limiting that to New York Heart Association two or three heart failure. Well, now that gets a little bit more complicated because there's no ICD code that separates two versus three. And, 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 and if a provider documents it, it may not be consistently documented from visit to visit. Uh, it may not be consistently documented provider to provider, and that becomes a little bit of a challenge. And now let's say that you want someone with heart failure, reduced EF, that's New York Heart Association class two or three, and they've been on guideline-directed medical therapy for three or more months. Well, now the latter is really hard because how are you going to easily figure out, you know, whether they've been on guideline-directed medical therapy or not? It's not a, it's not a problem with deep six. It's just a limitation of how the I and E criteria for studies don't often match what's easily extractable from the EMR. So there's always going to be some fine tuning that's required on the part of the nurse or nurse coordinator. But hopefully you've simplified it by whittling away ninety percent of the garbage. Uh, that is totally inconsequential uh, to the study. Next slide. So I'm going to end there. I'm going to turn it over to Tony, uh, and I'm happy to answer any uh, questions you may have. I greatly appreciate your time uh, today to allow us to share the experiences we've had at the Valley Health System uh, with Deep Six AI. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mattel. I'm going to kick off with a quick moderator question, give everyone time to get their questions into the chat. Um, are you able to use the program for all types of trials? And if not, how do you figure out which are the best trials to use it for? Yeah, 
So that's a very good question. And I want to be fair, you know, we're early uh, into our experience. So, you know, when you're early into experience, you 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 go through this uh, learning process where you're trying to find the right patients. And right now we've been concentrating on, of course, we base it on the priority of the study to our institution and how well suited we think a trial is to be able to sort through IE criteria, you know, based on the information that's available readily uh, within the EMR system. And that's how, uh, you know, we've been doing it. Uh, and uh, over time, you know, we would love to get to the point where it's synonymous with every trial, but we have a little bit more learning to do before we get there. Awesome. Did you find it challenging to review CPET, ECHO, ECG, and lab data? Yeah. So those are like classic examples. So like, for example, you know, ECGs uh, are in the system, but they may not often, they may not uh, uh, obviously write, for example, you know, right bundle branch block from left bundle branch block from IVCD. So things like that, uh, you know, can be difficult. Or if you're using cardiopulmonary exercise testing, you know, it may be in some patients, it may not be in others. It may, in our case, we have an additional issue where we have a separate EMR for the inpatient and outpatient side of things. And some things like CP is uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing may be done on the hospital side, you know, where uh, that information is in a different EMR than the inpatient side. So we've also had to be sensitive to starting studies where the bulk of the information we need will be in on our outpatient EMR. So it's some of the intricacies you have to think about. Uh, again, not a fault of Deep Six, but it's just, you know, the way our health system is constructed and how we leverage these technologies to maximal efficiency. Wow, that is a lot to keep in mind. Lots of complexities. Um, I have a question from the audience. Thank you for your informative presentation. Are you able to share how you were able to encourage your site to partner with Deep Six to yeah. improve? Yeah, so partly that's education, right? Because most people don't know about these technologies. So what you do is you present your initial experience and you say, listen, uh, you know, this is what we found and it sped up our enrollment time and time is money and institute and, and, and partners are more than willing, uh, you know, to try to help if it's going to speed up enrollment of the right patient at the right time for their trials. And so, you know, they are, uh, and when they start to see these partnerships with Graticule and Deep Six AI and they see the success stories, you know, more and more people, you know, get on board uh, uh, of these kinds of things. I think it's no different in my mind than, you know, there was a day that everyone had a local IRB and then they went to centralized IRBs and they saw the value uh, in doing that. And I think there's going to be no doubt in my mind that partners will see this as the next evolution of, uh, you know, how to get the right patient enrolled in clinical trials. Are you building your queries in-house? And if not, do you have a plan to bring on super users to do that? Tony, thanks very much, because I was going to answer that question, because I think it's a wonderful question that was asked by someone in the audience. And again, I want to be fully transparent. When Deep Six first presented this to us, the idea was, listen, any provider you know, can have this on their desktop and they can build these queries themselves and everyone who's interested in the research is going to do it. And we realized very quickly, well, for us, that wasn't going to work because it's just too difficult. You know, you just can't learn uh, the software and expect every individual provider to do it. And so we quickly realized that even though that's what Deep Six was recommending, for us, the better thing would be just as the, the questioner asked is that, uh, is that we would have super users. There would be people who are very gifted, you know, at using the platform uh, where the investigator can go to them and say, listen, I'm looking to build uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a builder uh, that deals with this study that has these inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we've had great partners at Deep Six and, you know, together working with our super users, you know, help us determine what's the most optimized way to build that study out. And that's been the win-win proposition. And I do think that that's the model we're committed to uh, going forward. Okay. Uh, one last question, just to wrap us up here. Uh, what made you decide to implement an AI program? And then how did it evolve? How did that decision evolve? Well, I, I will say that I feel very proud of the fact that 
you know, uh, as I joke to people that we thought that AI was the answer before AI became vogue and it became the new dot com where everyone throws the, word, the letters AI into every conversation. So we first uh, saw uh, started to converse with the uh, Deep Six in July of 2020. So, uh, you know, a fairly long time ago in the AI world of things. You know, this is well before chat GPT and generative AI or anything. And, you know, we were lucky enough to be recognized as a center that does a lot of research. And we're really thrilled to make this connection to Deep Six AI. And I could see back then that this was really the future of how we were going to basically do it. And I really hope over the next couple of years that, you know, EMR vendors and study sponsors and institutions and companies like Deep Six align uh, so that we can all be marching the same direction and optimize, you know, clinical trial enrollment and success. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all for joining today. Special thank you to Rob and Dr. Mittal for their fantastic presentations. I hope that the webinar has been informative and that you leave today with an understanding of both the utility of AI in clinical research, as well as the challenges and lesson lessons learned along the way from real world uh, implementation leaders in the field. Uh, Lashana, is there anything you need to add before we close? Yes, absolutely. I definitely want to echo, um, and I want to also thank you, Tony, um, and the Deep Six AI team, Dr. Mattal, Rob, extremely informative. Um, I'm hoping, again, that everyone can take some things back to their institutions and their organizations um, and figure out ways that could be more efficient in utilizing AI. Um, so, uh, Again, there are questions that I see all of the wonderful feedback. Uh, so hopefully you guys are catching that as well. Um, we have dropped in the chat, the presenters um, contact information. So please feel free to reach out. Um, as a reminder, please make sure you claim your contact hour by February 23rd, 2024. You have 30 days after the event. And I did drop that in the chat, but feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, our next event is scheduled on Monday, um, March 4th from noon until 1 p.m. It will be a webinar with Actalent, which is a global leader in um, talent solutions. So I'm super excited for them to join us. Um, and we here at Greater Houston of ACRP um, would love to be able to hear your feedback. Please feel free to reach out to us at any time. So thank you for your time. And I hope you guys have a wonderful remainder of your day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.